Right. Now it's recording. Okay. It's a humanity. It's a humanity? Is that what he says? The humanity? What's this? It's not the heat, it's the humanity. Lost the humanity? That's actually from an old Australian cartoon in the 1950s, I think. A couple of guys standing up and trying to do That's a good line for yeah. when under attack. Yeah. You know, you know yes, it's an conversation. Getting this hot in the other days. All right, I, I think we might as well start. So, uh, thank you for coming this morning. So, just to, to remind yourself what yourselves of what we are doing. Uh, so, Steve uh, Keen is visiting for the month. All right. Yeah. Let's get some focus. Yeah. 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 Steve is visiting uh, the Fields Institute for the month, and then uh, to to have a, a forum for us to exchange ideas and set uh, research problems to work in the future. Uh, we thought of having a regular series of seminars, so we've been having them uh, since. Uh, so this is going to be the fifth uh, of those. So we call it Sojourns in Nonlinear Economics, and and. Just to end on a high note, so we invited uh, distinguished uh, friends from other places. So today will be all from the uh, external visitors. We will we'll have two talks in the morning and two talks in the afternoon. And then the last one will be Steve. Steve gets the privilege of having the last word. Uh, <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to uh, have as the first speaker uh, Stephanie Kelton from the uh, University of Kansas City. Missouri, Missouri Kansas City. City. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mateus, for helping to put this together. Thank you to Steve for uh, the invitation to come and to Michael, I think, who may have suggested that this might be a good thing to do to bring us all together. So um, I know this is the Fields Institute, and ordinarily you would come and you would have a nice, rigorous mathematical uh, presentation of some kind, but uh, that's not what I'm going to do today. This is a lecture that's intended for a general audience of people who um, have an interest in some economic questions, policy questions, want to understand maybe the issues in a way that you don't often hear them explain um, in media and press and so forth. And so uh, I just want to begin by, whoop, do we have... Oh, we've got, um, <laughs> got to try to projector on. Is it turned on over there? I'll oh, see. So you should just press on the... Uh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so the... Oops, I'm going to go back. I've already tapped the head here. It'll slowly get this kid. <laughs> All of us oh, will be edited out. Here we go, time lags again. Right, this will all be edited out. Yes. Right, we have light. We have. It's doing its just good. Okay. Does anybody ever maintain these machines? I don't know. Okay, there we go. Right. There we go, all right. Okay, so the title of the talk is Money is No Object. And I'm being provocative here in a couple of different ways, and what I hope to convince you of by the end of the hour uh, is a couple, well, two things. The, the way that we conventionally think about money is, is wrong. We tend to think of money as a thing, and most often as something that's finite in its existence. Money is an object, and there's only so much of it out there, right? So we have to make difficult choices about what to do with money allocating money like any other scarce resource in the economy and so forth. So I want to kind of call that into question and then I want to extend that to say if money is not a physical thing that is limited and scarce like other resources and it can be created at will, so it is infinite in some sense, then money is no object when it comes to affordability and being able to do the kinds of things that we want to do to sustain the macroeconomy at a targeted level of employment, for example. Right? So this question, what is money, begs an answer. And the usual description that you find in the textbooks is one that I find very unsatisfying. And I like uh, this from a gentleman named Heinrich Minsky, who is an economist that many of you in the room are probably familiar with. In Minsky's most famous work, Stabilizing an Unstable Economy, Minsky says, Anyone can create money. Uh, 
wow, that's kind of nice to know. Anyone can create money. The trick is to get it accepted. Okay, how different does that sound from what, if you've ever had a course in economics, whether it's micro or macro, from the principal's level all the way up to the graduate level, you've probably encountered a story that begins, when you get to the page that begins to talk about money, what's the first thing you see? Once upon a time, right? It begins like a fairy tale. Why? Because it is. Once upon a time, man conducted his affairs on the basis of barter, right? This is dominant within the discipline in economics. It has its roots in the medalist tradition, which is the bipolar, right, the opposite end of the spectrum from what I'm going to describe in a few moments, the chartalist or cartalist or state theory of money. The old idea that money emerges spontaneously within the private sector as individuals make choices about how better to conduct their affairs. So as Smith said, man has a natural propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. It's in our DNA. It's what we do, right? We produce things, we specialize at some point, and then we pick those things up and we lug them to the local trading venue called the market, where we attempt to change that which we have into that which we desire, right? We attempt to make, make a trade. This is very clumsy. Gosh, you gotta specialize in something, and you're the best fisherman in the village, and so you catch fish, and you go to the local trading venue, and you have all the fish you need or want to sustain yourself, but what you really need is a clay pot to cook your fish in, maybe a new pair of shoes to walk around in, whatever it is, right? So off you head to the local trading venue with your surplus fish, looking for someone who both has what you want and wants what you have, right? So barter is e inefficient. It's clumsy. It requires the famous double coincidence of wants. Unless the double coincidence of wants is satisfied, no, ch no trade can take place, right? Barter involves these heavy transaction costs. This economists sometimes use the term shoe leather costs. You have to presumably walk around for a long time in order to find someone who wants what you have and has what you want. So money helps to take care of this problem, right? And what do the textbooks tell you? Old money and banking textbooks, new money and banking textbooks, it doesn't matter. The same story gets repeated in all of them. And the story begins in that once upon a time sort of fashion where we struggle to overcome the inefficiencies of barter and the first thing that humans decide to use to mediate, to alleviate the, the inefficiencies of barter are primitive monies, beads, feathers, cowrie shells, dancing ladies, really it's in a money and banking textbook, dancing ladies, you know, cattle, fish, stones, all of these things that were supposedly early forms of money somewhere at some point in human history. And then eventually, the next stage of evolution, the story goes, well, some of those things just don't make a very good money thing. Fish don't last forever, right? Cattle are very hard to lug down to the marketplace, and what do you do if cattle is your money thing, and what you're after is just a pair of shoes or a clay pot? What's the exchange value, right? A leg for a pot? It's not divisible. It's not a good money thing. This is the story. So humans decide precious metals. That's what we should be using. This makes a better money thing. It's portable, it's durable, it's divisible. This is, this is what we ought to do. So the next stage of the evolution and the story in the textbooks goes, man invented commodity monies, right? And then eventually, you move away from having to actually pull out gold coins, silver coins, and make transactions. You begin trading with paper but the paper is convertible into precious metals, gold or silver. So you have convertibility. So when you're answering the question, why would people take worthless pieces of paper in exchange for something of value, like a cattle or a fish or whatever, well, it's because the paper is as good as gold, right? Convertible into gold. And then we reach the next stage in the evolution of money, which is where we are today, pure fiat currency, right? Intrinsically worthless, not convertible into anything else at a fixed price, 
why do people accept it? This gets difficult for the conventional textbook story, because if you ask them, why do people accept fiat money? It's intrinsically worthless, it's not convertible into gold. Well, they take it because they know they can go down and go to the marketplace and spend it. Well, why does the shopkeeper take it? Well, the shopkeeper takes it because he knows that he can pay his worker. Well, why does the worker take it? Well, the worker takes it because they know they can pay their landlord. Well, why does the... You see where the problem is? It's an infinite regress problem. You never get a satisfactory answer to the question, why do people accept intrinsically worthless fiat currency? Nevertheless, economists are undaunted by the problem and press forward with the simple once upon a time story. What is money? Money is what money does. Primarily, money is a medium of exchange. It's not interesting in and of itself. It's the thing we hand each other to get the real good or service. It simply intermediates or facilitates the exchange process. It also serves as a good store of value. Right? Money is what money does. It's a veil over the real economy. We don't too much have to pay attention to money. It's there, but it doesn't do anything important. This is something Steve Keen has been critiquing for an awful long time, right? That we don't really need money in our models. It's not important. It's a veil. Money, debt. It's just there to help us make the transactions that we're pre-programmed in our DNA to make anyway, right? We don't even need it in our models. Sitting next to Steve Keen is Michael Hudson, right? Who's written uh, a lot of work telling a very different story about the nature and origins of money. Where does money come from? Why do people use money? How do we tell a, a very different story? And this story evolves out of what we refer to as the cardalist or chartalist theories of money. Uh, an economist by the name of George Friedrich Knapp wrote a poem called The State Theory of Money. Many other economists have written about this less extensively than uh, Knapp did. But in any event, the story is there, but it's best told not by economists. Most economists don't know their history. They don't read outside of their discipline. So they don't, they're not simply just not aware of this other story about what motivates the use of money. Where do we find the origin of money? What is the nature of money? If you read the work of anthropologists, sociologists, numismatists, Michael Hudson, this is where you're going to get, I think, a much richer and a much more historically meaningful tale about uh, why societies began to use money instruments. You find here the story focuses on the origin of money in early credit and debt relationships. Money evolves along with debt, right? where you have not a society of people all deciding collectively, hey, Let's use money. It would be easier to conduct transactions, but an authority who imposes debt on a population requires them to pay that debt and tells them how they can eliminate the debt <coughs> obligation. In order to eliminate the debt to me, the authority, whether I'm the pal it's a palace community, whether I'm a, um, a palace chief, whether I'm the, the nation state, I'm going to impose debt on you. I will tell you what you have to do to eliminate the debt. You will provide real resources to me. I will pay for those real resources with something that you can then turn around and give back to me to eliminate your obligation. Right? The purpose in all of this, as Michael has told the story so well, I think, is that we should be focusing on the desire of the authority to get resources moved from the private to the public domain, and the way that that's achieved is through the imposition of debt, by imposing liabilities on others that they have to work off in order to earn that which is necessary to pay the tax, the fee, the fine to the state. So yeah. can, can, can't you have both stories? Like in some places there is a strong state that does that, and then maybe in other communities uh, there wasn't, and there was money as a medium of exchange. Well, you can certainly not... have both stories. But I mean, which... well, can, can you, do you have uh, historical records of both things All right. happen? This is my, we may never know. But, there but, are... but I'll just start in there quickly, because it's worth mentioning David Graves' work, which of course Exactly, I was going to mention that. Yes. that the, when looking about the society, you only find it quite a trivial handful, even in, like, in modern uh, you know, tribal societies or in any historical records we find. 
And what you tend to find when you look at both historical records and in cultures, it's actually communal exchange that precedes um, the money period. And what really goes on is mutual gift giving, which then generates mutual credit. And that's part of how those societies evolved because they were cooperative. We're not, uh, you know, the, the, the barter myth again has us behaving like uh, a couple of uh, one of the you know, wild animals that hunt alone and get together to exchange and don't have any communal relations. But in fact, it's a friendship thing and a society. So you, I give you a gift, um, you feel an obligation to me, and you then return the gift later. And I think what we see coming out of when we get to the agrarian societies and that. I think that mutual gift giving becomes, and, and, and mutual credit becomes encapsulated in what the entity, which is a combination of religion, state, and commerce, brings together. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, Graeber goes out looking for answers, and he goes out looking for examples where the other story actually could hold some right. water. And he comes up with, as Steve said, very few um, examples of that. In fact, what economists have tended to do is to read the present into the past. And so when you right. see, tribal societies engaged in communal gift giving and you see one side go like that and the other side go like that and you see wampum beads you know mm. moving back and forth we say oh they must be paying with the beads that must be how they paid for the other thing so therefore beads were an early form of primitive money it's not it's not what's going on okay but that takes us a little bit afield okay so forget all the history regardless of the origin of money what do we know today because now I want to move into the present and have a discussion about the kind of monetary system we have today and what it needs. Regardless of where money came from, all money exists, and I argue, uh, and I have argued in many publications, as, as debt, as simultaneously debt and credit. Money, at the end of the day, is a social relationship. It involves two parties. You must have a debtor and a creditor. Money exists simultaneously as an asset and a liability. All money is an IOU. The I is the debtor, the U is the creditor. Okay? All of these IOUs, money is a recording device. Money, debt, credit is recorded in some unit of account. Right? Who chooses the unit of account? The person imposing the liabilities, the person imposing the debt. In Australia, the unit of account is the Australian dollar. In the US, the US dollar. In Canada, Canadian dollar, Japan, the Japanese yen, in Britain, the British pound, and in Italy, the pasta. Right? <laughs> What's different? It, yeah. it turns out to be very important. Right? The money of account, the unit of account, is an abstract convention. It's not something you can feel, it's not an object. It's like an inch, or a hectare, or a yard, or a meter. It's abstract. It's something that only humans can conceive. It represents a relationship. It records those social debts. In any modern nation, the money of account is chosen by the national government. Any place on the globe that you can point to, the money that is circulating, you can rest assured, is chosen by the authority, right? by the state government. This is something that's not new, it's not modern in this sense. It's something that if you go back to Aristotle, you can find this. It's certainly an Adam Smith, and it runs through uh, the works of a large number of economists, right? though not in fully developed form. In Keynes's Treatise on Money, which is the major work that he published just before the general theory, Keynes tells us the age of charterless or state money was reached when the state declared what things should answer to the money of account, to the unit. What things should answer. Today, all civilized money is beyond the possibility of dispute. Charterless. He says also in the treatise, the state claims the right to write and rewrite the dictionary. So think Italian government. To write the dictionary, it's the lira. That's our unit of account. And then to rewrite the dictionary. Cross out the lira, add euro, right? To write and rewrite the dictionary. This is a right claimed by all sovereign governments. So the sovereign government does four important things. It defines the unit of account. What will be the unit of account in that state? It imposes taxes, fees, fines, and other obligations. It decides 
what it will accept in payment of those taxes, fines, fees, and obligations, and it chooses how it will make its own payments. Okay, those are four important decisions that any sovereign government makes. Most sovereign governments, though clearly not all, choose their own unique money of account and issue their own currency in that unit of account, the Japanese yen, the Canadian dollar, right? Most go with a one nation, one money approach. The money and the national borders overlap. Most governments also require that taxes be paid in a currency that the state has the exclusive right to issue. Exclusive right. It gives itself the monopoly to create that which is necessary to settle obligations to the state. When it does these things, it's operating with sovereign currency. Why does that matter? As long as the state has the power to enforce the tax obligations, the people need the government's money. We are so used to, I think, thinking in terms of the government needing our money. But if the state is the issuer of the currency and grants itself exclusive power to create the currency, why on earth do they need to come to us to get the currency? The currency comes from them. And we accept it because we need it to settle obligations to the state. The currency will have value. People will be willing to work in order to produce, in order to earn the currency, because it's necessary in order to settle debt, in order to settle obligations. Right? Whatever the government accepts in payment to itself becomes what George Friedrich Knapp called the definitive money of the system. I put definite, it should be definitive. And it is the final means of settlement. So here the chartalists, the cardalists emphasize the means of payment function of money, the, the role that money pays in extinguishing obligations and eliminating debt. Okay, so go back to Minsky, anyone can create money, the trick is to get it accepted. Anyone can create money, then we can think of a whole range of money things. I can create money, Michael can create money, Scott, Mateus, everybody in this room can create money. The state can create money, banks create money, but all money is not created equal. Some IOUs are more acceptable than others. Some will circulate more widely. Some will serve as a good medium of exchange, and others will be rejected. Some will make a means of payment, a final means of payment. You can settle your debt by handing over the IOU of someone else. Others won't. Okay, what's the difference? Which IOUs are most special? I mean, my argument uh, is that the IOUs at the top of the pyramid are the most special. Those are the IOUs, the money things, that are going to be the most accepted. And whose IOUs are those? So if anyone can create money, households can do it, financial institutions, banks can do it, non-bank firms can do it, government can do it, whose IOUs are the most acceptable? So you get a layering of IOUs, like a pyramid. The most acceptable are at the top, the least acceptable are at the bottom. So imagine that after this lecture today, I go out uh, to lunch and I pay with my credit card. Right? I go into debt. I issue an IOU on myself and I get to eat the food and I get to walk out. Am I finished? I'm not finished. Right? A couple of weeks later, I go to the mailbox, there's the bill from Visa. What do they want? Well, they want to be paid for the meal, right? They extended me credit. So what do I do? I get out my checkbook, I write a check, put it in the mailbox, off to Visa. Visa gets the check. So I'm transferring the IOU of someone higher in the pyramid. Visa gets my check. Are they happy? Is it done? Visa doesn't want my check. I mean, I have a really lovely signature, but it's not at the end of the day what they're after. They aren't happy with the check. They want what happens after the check goes through its clearing process. What Visa wants is a credit to its bank account, which gives it a claim on government money, right? I have to transfer the IOU of someone higher in the pyramid to get out of my own debt. That 
results in the transference of another IOU higher in the pyramid, and the only way to ultimately eliminate my debt is to pay with state money. And we can have a long discussion about bank reserves and all that, but I, I don't have time. Um, trust me, at the end of the day, what happens is that Visa gets paid with something that gives it a claim on the government's IOU. Okay? So, if we look at the U.S. hierarchy, it looks like this. Then what I want to emphasize is the relationship between the government and the thing at the top of the pyramid. So in the case of the United States, the pyramid looks like this. The most acceptable form of payment is the U.S. dollar. Right? It is the only way, ultimately, to settle any debt denominated in U.S. dollars. Right? The government spends in U.S. dollars, collects taxes in U.S. dollars, it issues the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid. That currency, the U.S. dollar, is non-convertible. It's a pure floating fiat currency. We don't have a fixed exchange rate system. The government doesn't promise to convert dollars into gold or anything else at a fixed price. It's purely a fiat currency. Right? Again, why does that matter? What are the benefits of issuing the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid? It means all the stuff that, at least in the U.S., we hear every single day on the television and in the newsprint that the nation is on a, a fiscal, fiscally unsustainable path, that we're going broke, that we're going to become like Greece. All of that stuff is wrong. Right? The issuer of the currency can never run out of the currency that it grants itself the exclusive right to issue. You can't go broke. You can't be forced to miss a payment in your own currency. You can afford anything that's for sale in that unit of account. So the upper limit to the U.S. government's ability to spend, what's for sale in dollars? Because I could have it all if I wanted to. Right? If you're willing to sell something to me for U.S. dollars, I can, I can have it all. Okay? It doesn't need to borrow its own currency in order to spend. It issues the currency. It can set the policy interest rate at any level. It doesn't have to use its interest rate to defend or protect a stock of gold or another country's currency if it's on a fixed exchange rate system. It has control of the policy interest rate. This gives the state an expanded policy space. It gives you more elbow room in terms of your ability to use primarily fiscal, but also monetary policy to try to influence what's happening in the macro economy. This is the U.S. before 1971, 1973, two years matter here. I go with 73. That's when the uh, gold window is closed for good. Oops. Bretton Woods. Oh. Here's Smith friend.
much of the world is on a fixed exchange rate system that was known as an international monetary system called the Bretton Woods system. 44 countries participated, 43 of them fixed the value of their currency to the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. government made dollars convertible into gold at a fixed price. Okay, so it's a fixed exchange rate system. Under that monetary arrangement, the government in the U.S. is promising to convert dollars into gold at a fixed price. What sat at the top of the hierarchy under that type of monetary system was gold, not the U.S. dollar. And that places constraints on the government's ability to issue the U.S. dollar, because if it issues too many dollars, what's going to happen? People are all going to want to start converting to gold, and there's only so much because that is finite. Right? So it constrains your policy space. There's less fiscal room. There's less policy space under a monetary system like that. Same thing even after 73. You have lots of countries that continue to run fixed exchange rate systems. And as a consequence, you have lots of currency crises and debt defaults. Russia, 1978. Argentina in the early 2000s. Southeast Asia in 97. Mexico in 94, 95. All of these countries experience payment problems as a consequence of the fact that they don't control the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid. They get in debt in a currency that they have trouble then servicing the debt because of the nature of the monetary system that they've adopted. It gives them limited policy space. It robs them of the ability to use the interest rate, to set the interest rate anywhere they want to. So in the case of Russia, for example, Russia is fixing the value of the ruble to the U.S. dollar. So they're pledging on demand to allow holders of ruble balances to convert rubles into the U.S. dollar to fixed price. Fine until everybody wants to do that. Right? And when too many people start choosing to convert to the U.S. dollar, you have a problem. Because in order to maintain the peg, you need a sufficient holding of your reserve asset, which is the dollar. And if everybody's converting into dollars, you're losing your dollar reserves. So what does the Russian government do? They respond by trying to compete with the desire to convert to U.S. dollars. They say, hold on, you don't want U.S. dollars. What you really want are GKOs, Russian government bonds. How about take this instead? This pays interest. You'll like it. It's nice, right? And the rural people who were holding rubles said, no, I really just prefer the dollar, thanks. Well, hang, hang on. Uh, what about a, at a higher interest rate? Wouldn't, wouldn't that appeal to you? Let's just raise the interest rate a bit. Come on, take the GK up. No, I'm, I'm good, good with dollars. I'm, I'm going to have the dollar, please. Well, wait, 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 wait. A little bit higher? A little bit higher? You know how high interest rates went? 150% before the fixed exchange rate system blew up and Russia was forced to float the ruble and default on debt and so forth. So these are very um, limiting types of monetary systems, right, to put it mildly. You give up control of your interest rate, you constrain your policy space, and you become heavily dependent on current account surpluses, on trade, because it's the only way to accumulate for the non-government sector, for the private sector, when you're constrained in your ability to run deficits, a surplus in the private sector. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, what about the euro? The euro is an exceptional case. It's not a fixed exchange rate system, but it definitely limits the policy space, and it introduces a relationship between the governments that use the euro and the hierarchy that takes away that relationship of one nation, one currency, I control the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid because they don't, right? All of these countries, the 17 countries that adopted the euro, gave up their sovereign currencies and adopted what's effectively a foreign currency to them, right? Modeled on the one market, one money principle. One mark, we all do so much trade together, why don't we, for efficiency reasons, just use the same thing? It goes back to the old medalist argument. Right? Money is just the thing we hand around, and it's more efficient if we all hand around the same thing because we do so much trade together. What difference could it make? Right? So it turns out it makes a, a huge difference. Right? Now these countries are users of the currency, not issuers of the currency. And because they no longer issue the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid, they can run out of euros, they can go broke, 
They can become insolvent. They can be forced to miss a payment. They have limited policy space. And they have to pay market rates of interest. They can't set their own interest rates. So it turns out that money matters. This is something Steve has been emphasizing, again, for a long time, as have many in the post-Keynesian tradition. Money matters. Money is not this afterthought that you may or may not put into your model because it's really just like a veil over the real economy and that's what matters at the end of the day. Money matters and governments should be in control of the currency that sits at the top of the pyramid. If they give up the control, they also give up some of their policy space. This is Abba Lerner, who was a contemporary of Keynes's, an institutionalist, post-Keynesian economist, who says, by virtue of its power to create and destroy money by fiat, or to take money away from people through taxation, the state is in a position to keep the rate of spending in the economy at the level necessary to achieve full employment, and to sustain full employment. Okay? It's something that no capitalist economy has ever achieved. We have fleeting periods of what might be characterized as full employment. Unemployment rates of 2.5% in Europe, 3%, 3.5% in the US, and we call that full employment, but they're always fleeting, and they usually come during wartime, or speculative bubbles. Right? But no capitalist economy has ever successfully sustained full employment. And learners arguing that if you have the right type of monetary system, and the degree of uh, policy space that comes with that, then you can take advantage of that and you can actually do what hasn't been achieved before. Keep your economy operating at full employment. So how do currency issuers spend? How does the issuer of the currency spend? It spends by giving instructions to have somebody else's account credited. Now, with modern money, the age of electronic money and so forth, this frequently happens without the government even writing a check. Social security payments are made automatically. You're sitting at home looking online at your bank statement and you see $2,000 in your account and then suddenly the numbers change and you see $3,500. Where did that come from? Oh, I just got my credit into my account from the government, right? They spend with keystrokes. This is something Ben Bernanke has been really forthcoming about. Alan Greenspan has been very forthcoming. This is how modern governments spend. Do we understand this? No. Too often we don't. So we have our president going on television and in response to a question, are we, are we out of money? When will we run out of money? He says, we're out of money now. That's his response on television. We're out of money. It all starts really getting bad when this guy makes his appearance. And this is Ross Perot, a little Texan who ran for president back in 92. Um, you just realized how long ago. Boy, I did 92. So he goes on TV, runs for president, right? He's famous with his flip charts. And he's sort of the Pete Peterson of his day. And he goes around scaring the hell out of everyone, telling them that if I ran you know, my business the way this government runs its operations, why I'd be bankrupt. And he had a little Texas accent. And he just showed everybody that, that this is really, really irresponsible. The government is spending money it doesn't have. It's burdening our grandchildren, you know, the arguments, all that. It's got to live within its means, just like the rest of us do, right? So we think we're broke. And this narrative that governments are like households, it's just like one big household. And it really needs to play by the same rules as a household. When you and I tighten our belts, it's responsible for the government to tighten its belt too, and so forth. Is that, does that make any sense at all? Is the government really like a household? You know, a fixed exchange rate system. We don't pledge to convert our currency into gold or anything else. We spend by hitting keys on a keyboard. But we act like we're still on one of these ancient monetary systems. I mean, the world truly does change in 1971. Nixon closes the gold window. We go off Bretton Woods completely by 73. It's all done. Everything changes. And we play by the same rules that apply under the old monetary system. 
Why? Well, for one thing, we look around, we see what's happening in other parts of the world, and we say, dear God, if I don't get my fiscal house in order, I'm going to end up like Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, right? All, all of them. This is very powerful in the U.S., and they hit this over and over again. And Americans, by and large, are convinced, because if you take polls, Americans say the deficit is one of the most important problems we face today. I want the deficit to come down. And this is part of the reason that we're so terrified. But we don't understand what makes us different from those countries over there. Right? We still have our keyboard. We have a currency that we issue. We have sovereign money. They adopted a foreign currency. They can't issue the currency. And because they gave up their sovereign currencies and adopted something that they can't issue, financial markets have a great deal of power that they don't have in a country like the US, like the UK, like Japan, where financial markets know that the risk of default is essentially nil. If you can always pay, the presumption is you will always pay. Right? There is the ability to pay, and that gives financial markets confidence that you'll make your payments. Financial markets understand that Greece and Ireland and Portugal might not be able to come up with the euros. Because the only place they can get the euro is to raise it by collecting taxes. And when your economy goes, your tax receipts go. And so to fill the gap, as other forms of spending increase, right, automatic stabilizers kick in, government spends more on social safety net programs, taxes are falling off, the deficit widens, how do you fill the gap? Borrowing, but you got to go to capital markets, hat in hand, ask for euros, and they say, well, we'll, we'll lend, but the risk of default is getting fairly high, so in order to make the loan, we need a premium, right? That default risk premium begins to climb. The penalty is assessed by the financial markets, and these countries are now like individual states in the U.S. Greece is like Georgia. Georgia can't issue the currency. Georgia has to go out and borrow the dollars in order to spend. This is why there's such a crisis with state and local governments in the U.S. They can't do what the federal government can do. Okay? The Eurozone countries have transferred the spending authority to the financial markets. You tell us how much we can spend. How much are you willing to lend? Right? You can shut us off completely, right? You can cut off borrowing. The U.S. still has its keyboard. We're not like Greece. We're not going to be like Greece. We can never be forced to miss a payment. We can't become insolvent. We always have the ability to pay. We can't run out of money any more than a scorekeeper at a sporting event can run out of points. Right? When was the last time the Blue Jays played last night? They, I would say they beat my Kansas City Chiefs, but they're not really uh, oh, the Royals. See, I don't even know. The Royals, right, that's baseball. This team's played last night. And when was the last time you went to a sporting event and saw, you know, a really lopsided game? One, one side's just running away with it, putting up point after point after point. And you sat in the stands and you thought, oh my God, if they keep scoring at this rate, they're going to run out of points. Where you'd never respond that way. You'd, that would never occur to you. But this is basically how we respond when it's the government issuing its own currency as if it somehow is an object that is finite that it's going to run out of at some point. Right? Money is not an object. Here's Alan Greenspan on 60 Minutes with uh, an interviewer named Scott Pelley. And Scott Pelley says, these are quotes, right? Pelley says, is that tax money the, the Fed is spending? And Bernanke says, it's not tax money. He says, we just use the computer to mark up the size of the account. I mean, that's how we spend. We just, that's a quote. My colleague at UMKC, um, Randy Ray, wrote a paper with a couple of PhD students looking carefully at the extent of the Fed's intervention in the last, uh, well, since the start of 2007, I guess. And they came up with a number of $29 trillion. That the Fed has intervened to the tune of $29 trillion since the start of the economic trillion. $29 trillion. Now, where did they get the $29 trillion? They can get it from anywhere. Right? 
they keystroke it into existence. It doesn't exist until it's keystroke, but once it's keystroke. Uh, so yes, go ahead. Where, where does that approach world GDP, whatever that might mean, uh, pretty much showing? What is world GDP? Six? I think it's, what is it, uh, 100? I think it's around 50 or 60. Okay, so the point I want to leave with, I mean, I don't want to leave and not have everyone at least remember that I said this. The issue where the currency can always pay. Okay, here's Alan Greenspan. Government cannot become insolvent with respect to obligations in its own currency. If my debt is in the U.S. dollar and I'm the U.S. government, of course I can always service the debt. The dollar comes from me. The U.S. dollar comes from the U.S. government. A fiat money system like the ones we have today can produce such claims without limit. That doesn't say it should produce such claims without limit. That says it can, right? There's no operational constraint on its ability to create the currency. It's the monopoly issuer of the currency. So if we can do all of these things and we have all of this policy space, why is the recovery so weak? And I think we, we could all probably answer this question. For one thing, we significantly underestimated the severity of the downturn. Thought that with traditional uh, pump priming, a little pump priming, and a good swift response from the central banks of the world, cutting interest rates, maybe a little QE if necessary, we can right this ship really quickly. Right? Just use your, use your policy tools, same ones you always use. Right? Believing that the Fed is much more powerful than it, than it is, believing that the money multiplier works, that if you give banks reserves, they will go out and make loans. Those loans will result in spending. The spending will drive GDP growth, employment, and so forth, and we'll be on the road to recovery. So all of these things were mistakes. A failure to appreciate that what we're really dealing with is a balance sheet recession, that the private sector's debt to income ratio is so high that even if you provide more income for a sustained period of time, people are going to be paying down debt, not buying newly produced goods and services. The economy is going to take a long time to recover. So I think for all of those reasons, we've been fighting the fight the wrong way. On top of that, you have all this fear about becoming Greece and all the deficit hysteria, especially in the U.S. Okay, so we have do you use the terms in Canada deficit hawk and deficit dove? Is that a common term? No, but we hear it often in the U.S. There, okay. <laughs> so you know that the dominant groups in in the U.S. come from essentially the two different parties. The party that likes to call themselves fiscal conservatives, the Republicans, they're the deficit hawks. I mean, a deficit is a bad thing, it's irresponsible, it burdens the next generation, we should never run them unless they're in office. And, you know, you just don't want deficits at all. Even, you know, even in bad times, you don't want deficit spending. So they say they oppose it on principle. And they say they favor things like sound money. And sometimes you hear people in this camp advocate for things like 100% reserve backing. We ought to go back to a gold standard where governments have to be restrained in what they can spend, and that will restore fiscally responsible governments and so forth. Okay? They would advocate things like balanced budget amendments, amend the U.S. Constitution to make sure that the government always balances its budget. And then you have the, the deficit hawks. The kinder, sorry, sorry, the doves, the, the deficit doves, thank you. Well, you any deficit dorks, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the deficit doves are the kinder, gentler, anti-deficit folks. And they say, well, it's true that deficits are dangerous, and it's true that we do need to tighten our belts and get our fiscal house in order, but it's also true that unemployment is high, and the economy is sort of fragile, and if we start to tighten too soon, we could jeopardize the recovery, and so let's focus on deficits in the medium term, but in the short run, let's focus on, you know, growth and so forth, and we might actually have to spend a bit more to do that, and but we'll take care of the deficit later, because you're right, we agree with you, deficit's bad, okay? And then you have, and I'm sure you've all heard of the deficit owl. 
The deficit owl is who? This is part of a, um, this was taken from the Washington Post article that was written about the approach that I'm describing, which is sometimes referred to as modern monetary theory or modern money theory. And it's been featured just this year in places like The Economist magazine, The Washington Post, The Financial Times, uh, Playboy magazine last month, serious five pages. Uh, so anyway, there, there was this piece in The Washington Post. They put together this little family tree. I kind of put owls, doves, and hawks up above to show the distinction here. Um, but what's a deficit owl? Okay, so this just tells you some of the people who are beginning to pay attention to this broad approach that I've been sort of describing to you for the last 35 minutes. Modern monetary theory or modern money theory departs sharply from the conventional textbook stories about, well, most things, um, certainly money and deficit spending and so forth focuses on unemployment as uh, socially harmful and economically inefficient and advocates for a full employment economy. Using the power that you have by virtue of the fact that you have the right monetary system and the degree of fiscal space that you need to achieve full employment, it says, well, then we ought to do it, right? We don't need 25 million people who want full-time jobs and can't find them. We can make that happen, okay? So the MMT deficit owl, or any deficit owl, would assign no arbitrary limit to the size or the duration of the deficit. You would never say, if you're a deficit owl, the deficit should be cut in half by the year 2017. How do you know what the economy is going to look like in 2017? You might have a surplus. You know, who knows? Maybe your trade balance reverses and you get a huge current account surplus, and your budget can actually move into surplus. You don't know today what your budget should look like in the future. The policy goal, the target, should not be the size of the deficit. The target should be what's happening in the real economy. Set real goals, like full employment, right? And let the deficit move where it needs to, to achieve that real goal. A deficit owl would never consider the government's budget position in isolation. They would always think about where the government's budget is, surplus or deficit, with respect to what's happening in the other sectors in the economy. You have to. You can't look at the government's budget in isolation. So as a starting point, you can say the government's deficit, if the government is spending more than it's collecting, spend 100, collect 90. Where the other, who got the 10? The non-government. Went to the non-government sector. So the government's deficit is by definition, and to the penny, the non-government's surplus in financial terms. Right? Similarly, if the government collects more than it spends, I'll take 100 and I'll spend 90. I, I have the extra 10, but you have lost 10. So my surplus is your deficit. Right? This is double entry bookkeeping. It's true by definition. It follows the laws of accounting. So what does it show? It shows that in any certain period, any sector in the economy can be spending more than its income, running a deficit, spending less than its income, running a surplus, or exactly spending equal to its income, balancing its budget. If we separate the non-government sector into private, domestic, and foreign, then we have three sectors we're dealing with. Domestic public, domestic private, and the rest of the world, foreign sector. All of those income payments, purchasing newly produced goods and services, savings, the leaking, leakages and injections in the economy, everything has to come from somewhere and everything has to go somewhere, has to end up somewhere. So you have flows that result at the end in an accumulation or a drawdown of a stock. Right? So it's a stock flow analysis of the payments that take place across the sectors in the economy. It has to follow just one rule. Not everybody can be in surplus at the same time. Not everybody can be in deficit at the same time. That should be intuitive. Right? I can't run a surplus. I can't earn more than I spend unless someone else 
spend more than air. Right? So at least one sector has to be in deficit. At least one. Could be the domestic private, could be the domestic public, could be the foreign sector. But someone's going to take that deficit position. Who, who usually takes the deficit position? This is a graph that Scott Fulweiler put together, and he maintains and updates, and the rest of us are all so grateful because we all use it all the time. This is the actual data. This is not, you know, manufactured hypothetical stuff. This is the actual data for the U.S. economy, and the red is the public sector. Whenever the red is below the zero line, government is running a deficit. The green is the rest of the world. So back in the Back in the old days, the U.S. used to run trade surpluses, little ones, but we ran trade surpluses. The rest of the world ran a deficit against us. Now we run trade deficits, so the rest of the world is accumulating surpluses against us. Right? So look what happens. If the government is running a deficit, it means they're spending more than they're taxing. That ends up adding to the private sector surplus. If the rest of the world is also buying more from us than, they're, than we're buying from them, that also adds to the private sector surplus. So if you add these two together, you get exactly that. Right? What do you notice about the, the picture? First thing, it's a mirror image. You can see that, right? Why? Because the sum of all balances has to equal zero. It has to. The private sector is almost always in surplus. The public sector is almost always in deficit. Look what happened during the so-called Clinton boom. The Democrats love to brag about this. Right? In the U.S., this is a badge of honor to have been associated with the Clinton administration, which brought us the first budget surpluses in decades. Right? We are the real fiscally responsible party. We know how to bring you a surplus. Well, was that really good for the economy? Take the federal government's surplus, which means they're taking more in taxes than they're spending, driving the private sector down, on top of the fact that the rest of the world is taking more from us, because we buy imports, than they're buying from us, driving us further down. So you get these huge, private sector deficits that are being financed by the private sector taking on more and more debt. Right? So this is huge leverage building up here. It results in a recession. The government's budget moves right back into deficit where it normally is. We plug along for a while, we get the housing boom, right? Houses become uh, ATM machines, people buy Houses, not homes. You get more leverage. You get another recession. The government's budget moves sharply into deficit. But what happens to the private sector? They move sharply into surplus. And so this is what's happening as a consequence of those huge government deficits that everybody's so worried about. The private sector is being pushed back into surplus territory where they're now earning more than they're spending, income greater than expenditure. The private sector is running surpluses, and it's helping the private sector to deleverage. It's helping them repair their balance sheets. Okay, one thing I want to point out, and I'd love additional help in thinking this through and the math and all of this, um, but there is something going on here that I always emphasize, and this is the private sector's balance. And what I try to point out is, not only is the private sector usually in surplus, but that it needs to be in surplus. Okay, the private sector lives up here in surplus until recently, when we start taking on so much debt and becoming so leveraged that we cross the zero line and we end up down here running deficits. But what I notice, these are recessions. The U.S. has had 11 recessions since World War II. 11. In every single case, immediately preceding a recession, you have a sharp reversal in the private sector's budget position. It doesn't mean the private sector went into deficit. It just means that either the surplus shrank significantly or 
that you moved into deficit. But you have a reversal leading up to every one of these recessions you have, right, every single time. So it seems to me that what policymakers should be doing is focusing on the behavior of the private sector's budget position and anticipating those turning points that seem to precede all of the recessions that we've had since the end of World War II. Okay, very quickly, I'm almost to the end. This is the deficit the government ran after the financial crisis and the ensuing economic meltdown when the budget deficit exploded. Look what it did to the private sector balance. Remember, they move opposite to one another. As the government begins to cut its deficit, it's cutting the private sector's surplus. Why is that a concern? Because of the last graph I just showed you, that when the private sector's balance turns sharply down, it tends to perceive a recession. Okay? I just, I've already said all that. Okay, so I, I'm making the argument that the private sector needs to be in surplus. And so how do you do that? There are three ways to put the private sector in surplus. A combination of a government deficit, government spending more than it takes, leaves you with a surplus, plus the rest of the world spending more buying from us than we spend buying from them, leaves us with more. So those two things together guarantee you a private sector surplus. Or if you're like the US and you run current account deficits, you have to have a government deficit that's bigger than your current account deficit to offset the outflow that's happening because of the trade deficit and keep your private sector in surplus. So it, it would require a government deficit bigger than whatever your current account deficit is. Or you could have a current account surplus, like the lucky countries in the Eurozone. Those Germany, those that are able to achieve current account surpluses can afford to run smaller government deficits and still keep their private sector in surplus. Only countries with trade surpluses can avoid running government deficits. And what I'm saying is to keep their private sector in surplus. Okay, the problem with that is, as wonderful as it sounds, well then the solution is for everybody to run a trade surplus. And then we don't have to have government deficits anymore. Problem is, of course, that everybody can't run a trade surplus because one country's surplus is the result of another country's deficit, right? So we, we can't all adopt that strategy. I'm sorry, Germany, right? We can't all do what you've done. Okay, th these are questions that came up and I scared him off with um, visions of Weimar Germany and so he's gone now, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but maybe he'll come back. So what are the things that prevent us from moving forward with more sensible macroeconomic policy? And I think the usual response is that it would set off hyperinflation if we were tr to use the government's power to spend in the way that I've described, that um, somehow it would cause interest rates to go up because as the deficit goes up, the interest rate will go up. It's all the orthodox thinking about loanable funds markets and crowding out and all this, the Chinese refusing to buy our debt. Uh, and, you know, people losing faith in the dollar or whatever. So as a result of those fears, unfounded as I think they are, we end up in this, you know, um, muddling along sort of economic situation where these are graphs that were actually done by Bill Mitchell, who said, well, let's just project out. The red line is where we would have been had there never been a financial crisis and an economic downturn. The red line is sort of the path that we were on. The blue line is where we actually ended up. That's actual, real GDP. The difference is the gap. It's all the output that we're giving up. We're not producing. It's the income that's not being generated because we continue to stay on that blue path. And so what he does is estimate that on a daily basis, this is for the US, every single day, we don't bring about a strong recovery and get back on that red line, we're giving up the equivalent of $9.8 billion every day. Like leaving $9.8 billion on the table every day. 
right? It's, it's the opportunity cost of staying in and muddling along as opposed to getting back to full employment. So in the U.S. we have now one in four children officially living in poverty. We have a $2.3 trillion infrastructure deficit. The Army Corps of Engineers surveys all of the country's infrastructure, A, B minus, C, D plus, F. Overall, the grade in the U.S. is a D. A D. $2.3 trillion, they say, would be needed just to get us up to pass it. Right? So we have tremendous needs. We have unemployed manufacturing workers, construction workers, people with skills to build things, stuff that needs to be built, repaired, maintained, and we can't seem to figure out how to put the two together. And as I said, 25 million Americans who want a full-time job and can't find one. So it's a colossal failure of policy, and I think it's a failure of policy that um, derives directly from our failure to understand the nature of the monetary system, the flexibility that it gives us to do things, why we're not like Greece. And so very quickly, just in closing, the policy proposals that many of us have been putting forward for the last three years or so, uh, right on the heels of the economic downturn, what should we do? We said these three things, right? A full payroll tax holiday. In the U.S., we all have income withheld from every paycheck, pay into Social Security for retirement. <clears throat> they could suspend that. Just stop taking that income. Stop it all together. Cut that uh, to zero. That would put additional income into the pockets of those who most need it. 95% of Americans pay Social Security tax on every single dollar they earn. So if you eliminate for a time payroll tax holiday, that tax, you're putting the money right where it needs to go. Some folks who are struggling with high debt levels will use it to pay down debt. That's a good thing. Other folks like me will go out and buy something. That's a good thing. Both need to happen. And so we like that policy. Revenue sharing, just recognizing state and local governments are users of the currency. They're not issuers. They're in deep trouble. And because they're in deep trouble, they continue to cut and cut and lay off and lay off. And so everything the federal government is trying to do with the left hand to stimulate is being snatched away with the right hand by state and local governments who are doing exactly the opposite. And the last thing is, as I said before, no matter how good your macro policy is, fiscal monetary policy, you're not going to keep your economy at full employment. You're not going to do it. You can do it through fine tuning. There are always going to be people who want jobs who can't find work. And for those folks, when you get all the policy as good as you can get it, you're still going to leave some people behind. And so for those people, we like the idea of an employer of last resort or a job guarantee program, something modeled on what FDR did under the New Deal, which uh, with the Works Progress Administration, the WPA program, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, which was about um, sustainable development, revitalizing, uh, paying attention to energy use, and environmental concerns, and so forth, put people to work. There was a national youth administration that employed young people. We need something like that in the U.S. And so we like the idea of introducing a program like that, along with the other two, to help recover the economy. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Out of time, but yeah, we can take some questions. questions. Yeah, if you could put the Washington Post uh, picture back on the board, it's interesting that uh, the people you call the deficit, that uh, they call the deficit doves, are actually the debt hawks. Their solution is not only to run a government deficit, but more important, they say if only we can get the banks lending again, the economy can yeah. borrow its way out of debt. Yeah. So their solution is not only more government debt, but more uh, uh, public debt. And or public right. sector debt, and that's really, uh, as we'll hear in the later talks, the problem uh, today. They, uh, the difference is that government debts never have to be repaid. Adam Smith said that no government had ever paid the debt. Over time, it goes up and up and up. Private debts have to be repaid, or else you lose the property you pledged as collateral. So what they're doing is in vast. Their solution to the uh, downturn is to increase the debt deflation and increase the riskiness of the economy because they're unwilling to see that running a government deficit uh, is a good thing because the government money doesn't have to be repaid. They have the, uh, the electronic press. I, 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 I,
has a deficit, if the economy grows faster than the deficit, then the, that 2 GDP will, will deflate. Yeah, we're so preoccupied, aren't we, with the numerator and those equations. It's exactly. always the deficit to GDP ratio, the debt to GDP ratio, and everyone focuses on the numerator, and nobody pays attention to the denominator and says, if you want that ratio, for whatever reason, if you want it to come down, grow the denominator. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you go to this, uh, well, not particular slide about it, but the argument about the needing to run a private, a public sector deficit to provide a, a, a private sector Unless surplus. the current account is in surplus, yeah. 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 Uh, there's another way to look at that, which okay. I'll be talking about later, and that is to say that if you're going to have a growing economy and there are two sources of money, creation in the system, and when it's growing, both of them have to grow, which means you have to have new issues of private debt exceeding repayments and new issues of government spending exceeding taxation. If you don't have them both happening roughly in proportion to the economy, you're going to have one or two things happen. If you're going to have the sectoral, well, again, that happened as well, sectoral balances are occurring. But if the government runs a, a permanent, you know, zero balance, for example, then the level of credit money is going to grow relative to the level of state, of, of state money. And you're going to get, as we actually have seen happen in the last 40 years. So I don't take, I, I look at exactly the same phenomenon, but I'm interpreting it differently to say, if you're going to have a growing economy, then you have to have growing private debt and growing government created money. Sure, we, we would say that too. Yeah, but the, you seem looking at the same phenomenon with a different, right. different lens because right. that's a, yeah, a part of my argument again is that it's, when you say uh, you know, the, the sectoral balance argument, private sector saving is public sector deficit, it's partly arguing that there has to be, otherwise the system can't work. It can imply that, but it's not necessary, but it can be read that way. Well, look, Steve, I mean, look at the period of time. Yeah, but this, where... this, but this also comes back to how the accounts are defined, Michael might talk a bit about later as well. If you're working through the market tables, you're going to find yeah. that result. Uh, not necessarily including the change of right. debt levels and asset spending and right. so on inside there too. We need to have a, a comprehensive model that does all of that. Right. So um, part of what I'll uh, I, I take, you know, if you, if you're quite right, as a principle of accounting, yes, public sector deficit is private sector uh, saving. When you aggregate the entire private sector and include banks as part of it, don't differentiate them. Right. But we need to get to the stage where we differentiate all of that and then of course you get the relationships we've shown that you, you agree that they're you know, that you can have the difference between spending and income will be the sum of all the types of changes that debt we're getting into the system. Let me, can I just jump in? Yeah. This particular graph isn't about growth. It's about a min, under, an indicator of Minsky instability. That's what it is. So it, when you see the blue coming down too far, that's an indicator to you that there may be Minsky and fragility building up. It's, so we, we can't... We shouldn't critique this by expecting it to be telling us information that it's not intended to tell us. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, yeah I'm saying that it's, it's, yeah, it's to me it's saying, okay, it's something which is like, and it's necessary, I think, out the way that I'm So both are true. Yeah, what right. you right. said is uh, what you said. Huge amount, the huge right. amount of our debate is right. exactly the same proposition with different emphasis. Right. That's really, yeah. right. And what we're trying yeah, to do. Because people misunderstand both. So yeah, they need to have yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but if you put that on the graph, you end up having recessions on the gray. Uh, that one, yeah. yeah. So, so the thing is that when the private sector surplus is going down, that's the point that's where the there, 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 there's an expansion, there's leverage. Right. So I bet that there's growth there. Yeah. So the problem is not that point. The problem is the uh, it's, uh, it's the enough surplus, which is right. paying that, that is which is spending less. That yeah. is the recession. Yeah. The, the private sector whole pulling back yeah. and trying you can, to fix its Actually, you see that. Is the recession. The, yeah. the upturn begins. I mean, it begins. That's right. Yes. But it, so, so that's so, the so direct that's Steve's point. Yeah. And that's, that, that's where you, from here, you can see Steve's point there, right. that you, you have to have both. Yeah. 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 If you could show the pyramid that you started again with the government at the top. Which, you want uh, the US? Uh, yeah, with the government at the top. Uh, Amazingly enough, the Europeans don't understand this. The Europeans uh, in the Euro say that the government cannot run a deficit, and that's uh, uh, item 123 of their uh, uh, the EU constitution. So they say because the government, uh, the, there is no central bank to lend money to the governments, all the government deficits have to be financed by the bank. So in Europe, the banks are on top. And that means when the government created, runs a deficit, they have to pay interest to the banks, whereas the U.S. government doesn't. 
And it's so different over there, it's cognitive dissonance. They cannot understand this. They just imagine that a central bank is to lend money to the banks to lend money to the governments. And it's a completely different, uh, almost biological structure. It's a different change. And they don't understand this. Is it a um, question of definitions? You know, in, in this picture, you consider the central bank to be part of the green uh, triangle. But uh, in Europe, the central bank is part of the, uh, it's part of the banking system, That's right. not part of the government. That's right, right. So it depends on who the central yes. bank, right? And, they, and so the banks are on top, uh, determining everything, not the government. So uh, in Europe, the free marketers believe in central planning much more than Soviet Union and much more even than Nazi Germany. They believe that all central planning should be in the hands of Wall Street and the city of London, uh, not the government. And that's why they say uh, Angela Merkel got so upset with Greece, said you can't have a referendum over this. You have to appoint uh, a technocrat, meaning a bank lobbyist, someone like Alan Greenspan, someone who does what he's told by the banks. The, the other thing that drives me personally crazy is the idea that you can legislate the budget position. That you can say your deficit may not exceed three percent of GDP, right? So, so you say, well, no. I mean, the idea that governments have control over the size, of the, over the size of the budget. So you get a government like you know uh, Portugal, Greece, Portugal. Well, Spain that's running a surplus, yeah. right? That's run, that's budgets in surplus, sits on its hands, touches nothing. All of a sudden, the economy tanks, taxes fall off automatic stabilizers, payments kick in for unemployment compensation and all the other stuff. So I haven't done anything. My deficit is exploding around me and it's completely out of my hands. So not, you know, this idea that this is a willful policy, it's profligate spending and all that kind of stuff. I didn't do anything, right? The taxes went this way and the government spending automatically went that way and the difference became my widening deficit. And the, the idea that, you know, first it's the stability and growth pact, then it's the fiscal pact lend to you, but only if you promise to really, really, really stick to the rules this time. You can't stick to the rules. In it's Ireland, endogenous. In Ireland and Spain both basically follow those rules. Didn't they since the Great yes. in Europe? Basically up to 2008. And then okay. they right. Well, bodies. they didn't have to follow the rules because they had current account surpluses. In the case of Ireland, they had big current account surpluses, which allowed them to keep their private sector in surplus, not have a big government deficit. The economy was healthy, you're running big trade surpluses. And so, yeah, they're widely praised, right? Trichet comes out, everybody says, look at Ireland, the Celtic tiger, the model for the rest of you. But there's a fourth sector she left out, and that's fraud. <laughs> <laughs> the fraud sector? Um, uh, no, sorry. Uh, the policy measures that you mentioned at the end of this slide, mm -hmm. doesn't it have an assumption that uh, the government is the since the U.S. government uh, gives its own currency, so it's insolvent. It's not insolvent. Yes, that it so, can afford to so, do the things I said. So the kind of policy measures that you mentioned, it seems that the government would like it's. It seems that it's just the one part of the story because at one point of time, if the government is having lots of deficit, people will at the end lose faith in the government. Won't it? Won't that happen? Like the kind of policy measures that you are seeing that the government should always peep in and help the economy. Well, there, there it is. I mean, we didn't lose faith. But, uh, right? but, but, Over but, the course of 247 years, is that the right number of U.S. history? Yeah. The U.S. government has run budget no, but, surpluses but you're, you're, eight times, yeah, eight but, periods of budget. They have all ended in either depression or recession. I mean, well, I guess what, what Aditya is saying is that, so, so you need to tell the story that is specific for each of the countries. So this holds for the U.S. And over this whole history, the U.S. also happened to be the dominant uh, military power of, of the world. The relationship holds for every country. It Stephanie, doesn't hold Steph for every country. Stephanie has a PowerPoint that will show you about well, no. 15 other countries. No, but then, yeah, but then yeah. you, you see, then you go to cases, as we were talking before, that you know some countries did default, and then you say, well, but there were other circumstances for the country. For example, they were in a fixed exchange rate. Well, I think why, why did the, the, the no, 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 not that. I was saying, Run, running the policy to it. So why would a, a, a government want to be in a fixed exchange rate to begin with? They must have had good reasons for that. It's not that they are, you know, dumb and stupid. Oh, I just want to. Must, there must have been other reasons because they wanted well, to promote trade, because without a fixed exchange rate, people wouldn't invest in their country and, and things like that. There so, were political reasons. There were, there well, were the reasons, economic for, reasons for, that. for There were economic or perceived economic reasons. Right. But don't underestimate the importance of having the wrong paradigm. I mean, you've had Steve here for five weeks fighting against the wrong paradigm. Don't underestimate. No, no, no. I, 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 I understand. But now, you know, talking amongst friends, yeah. The, the, so, so, un 
understand then what the right paradigm is, you, you still need to see that each of the countries has particular historical and economic. That's right, but I can I can show you lots of data for lots of countries that are not global superpowers that have sustained deficits over decades and decades, and nobody's lost faith in the government, the currency, or any of that. I I can show all of that, independent of a country's reserve status as a reserve currency issuer or. or the fact that most of the debt is held domestically. I mean, it, it, I can do it for any number of countries. Right. right? But, but I guess what, what it is saying is that, you know, sometimes uh, shit happens to countries that try to do that. You know, they run into hyperinflation, they run into, well, you, you know, people taking all the, the not investing in the countries at all. So there must be some reasons why this but when we, when we talk about the job guarantee, what we're saying is let the government bid for labor that the private sector has a zero bid on. So you're not competing for any resources. You're right, not bidding right, up the right, price right. of anything, right? When we say rebuild the infrastructure, we're talking about taking resources that aren't currently in demand by the private sector. You have tons of slack. We're not saying use the government's power to push the economy beyond full employment. Okay. But when the resources are available, and especially labor wanting to be employed at a wage, should employ it. I, I guess my point is, despite the correctness of the paradigm overall, uh, Initial conditions matter, or how you got to the to the circumstances matter. They, For sure. Hello? I'm sure. sure. We, we uh, agree that. Right. If if Greece left the euro, okay, and went to went to the back to the drachma, and was a currency issue, just like Stephanie's talking about, the fact their initial condition would matter a whole heck of a lot. I do not know much about the other countries, but as far as India is concerned, India was not in a very good position, but in a decent position till the year 83, 84, 85. But the new Prime Minister came in, he was new, he tried to invest a lot in, like, lot in the many other things, the public sector things. At the end, India ended up in 1990 crash, like crisis, where India did not have enough money to pay even the 14 days of foreign debt. That was it. And that was because of the reason that, in, like, they, they you mean debt denominated in dollars or something? They borrowed yeah, in dollars? Exactly. Well, sure. Then you're taking on, remember, I said you always have the ability to pay debt denominated in the unit of account that is your own. The currency so is the issue. So at the end, like, you are not always paying everything in your currency. So that is what I was saying. That is just the half part of the story. At one point of time, you, people will lose faith in your currency. You will have to switch over to the other currency, right? I have a cab waiting for yeah. me. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. so sorry, but yeah. Scott is going to give a talk and he can answer so many yeah. of these questions. So, and uh, yeah. The ne next speaker is Michael, but I suggest we take a few minutes break before yeah. Michael starts. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.